Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott, and I'm here to read you a bedtime story. This week, I was so kindly asked once again to join Hometown Ghost Stories on their live stream. We discussed haunted headlines. It was so much fun. They always make me laugh so hard, and I'm so happy they had me on again. If you'd like to see my face, then you can check it out on YouTube, where the video version is, or you can listen to it as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. That is Hometown Ghost Stories, and it was Haunted Headlines Part 3. And on this show, we have quite the doozy of an episode. I wanted to provide something to get you through these long winter nights. Tonight's episode is by author Rhiannon Pugsley. Rhiannon lives and works in the English countryside, surrounded by trees, mud, and the disturbing sounds of, hopefully, animals. She can listen to all the audio horror she wants until the signal drops. Then she fills the time with her own stories and ways to stop the cat from eating her writing implements. This is Terms and Conditions. You open your eyes, slowly. It is bright at first, too bright. So you shut your eyes again. Wait. Try a second time. The room is large and busy. This is a weird dream, even by your standards. The walls are uncomfortably bright. Not white, exactly. Just brightness. Bodies are moving past you just shy of touching. They look a little lost, a little confused. They look how you feel. So you follow. They all seem to be going in the same direction. Reception desks in lines are at the end of a short walk. People line up in front of them. You watch. Something about the people is unnerving you, and you're not quite sure why. When individuals have finished whatever they are talking about at the desks, they move forward. Beyond the desks are doors. Three doors. People walk through one, hesitate at another, and pause so long at the third that some are forced through. You can't hear their shouting, even if you can see it. The person in front of you shuffles away, leaving you at the front of the queue. A woman sits there, behind the desk, scribbling on paper and tapping away on something. You're not sure what to say. So, you wait. She glances up twice before she pulls a new sheet towards her. 
There's writing on it. At least you think it is. It's no writing you can recognize. But her eyes skim it, and she nods. You want to describe her, to pick out her features and see if she is someone from work or an old school friend, maybe someone in the coffee shop that your subconscious has pulled to populate your dream. But her face blurs and fades in and out of focus. You can't tell how old she is, her skin color. You're not even sure she's female, now you think about it. All right, hon? Her voice makes its way into your head, although you don't remember her speaking. You don't reply, not sure how to. She looks at her paper again and sighs. All right, so... You're dead. Was it sudden? Sometimes sudden death can cause disorientation and confusion when people pass over. You frown at her. Dead. Dead? You say. Although, you can't hear your voice. She heard it, somehow, and she nods. You glance around. This is a very strange dream, clear and unfocused at the same time. Someone bumps into you. It's odd. It's the first contact you've had here so far, and it's cold. So cold. Like falling in an icy lake. Shock liquefying your bones. The person is screaming. Again, you can't hear it. Their mouth is pulled painfully wide. Eyes the same. They are clawing at others, trying to get away, away from... The door? The third door seems to be stretching shadows out. They are swallowing everything to get to this screaming person. Dread leaks into you, watching them come nearer, racing across that unknown distance, and yet moving so slowly... You aren't sure they're actually moving. You don't want to be close to those shadows. Something bad will happen when they get here. Something unthinkable that permeates into your soul. You stumble back, keeping away from the screaming person, not wanting them to touch you in case the shadows take you too. The shadows lick at their feet and then engulf them. The black retreats back to the doorway, dragging the person with them. You think you're breathing quickly, think your heart is pumping in your ears and throat. There are nail marks in the bright floor, but they're disappearing slowly. All right there? The woman is looking at you, Did she not see what just happened, or did it not bother her enough to turn around? Dead? You repeat. There is an unpleasant sensation spreading in your torso, something wet and warm, and another that is creeping into the back of your head, like that moment just before you remember An intangible string tugging you along. Afraid so, yes. The woman nods her head in your direction, and you glance down. There is a mess of something where your stomach was. It glistens too much, slimes and drips and squelches nauseatingly. You bring your hand up to try to poke it back in. It slips and plops onto the floor, tumbling and tipping into a gentle cascade of pink and red and gray. It's dawning on you now. You look up. The woman is a little clearer. Half her head is missing. 
One eye has dripped down her face. It turns to look at you. You look away. The parts of you on the floor are clenching at the sight. It was a mistake. You can see others now. Some old and wrinkled, but otherwise, all right. Some have vomit stains on their clothes and froth on their lips. There are blood stains, gaping holes, gaunt, sick and sallow skin. A few drag themselves, missing limbs and trailing stains behind them. Old, young, richly dressed and naked. You swallow and turn back, trying not to look too closely at the lady behind the desk with her one runny eye. Dead? You say again, just to be sure, because this dream no longer feels like a dream. You aren't entirely sure it is anymore. Runny-eyed lady sighs heavily. Something pink wiggles when she does. Yes. Guess you died nasty. Nasty normally gets more confused. So, where are you off to? Off to? Your eyes drift to the doors behind. Beyond, between, or behind? The woman's hand waves. Your eyes linger on the third door. It leaks malevolence. There's a sudden rush of anger, so hot you might believe your blood was boiling, and you don't know where it came from. You scowl. I... I have stuff. Oh. You'll want the haunting option, then. She pulls out a folder, thick and filled with aged paper that cracks and crinkles. There are stains on it. You try not to look at too closely. Please be aware of the haunting terms and conditions. Each death caused by you involuntarily or not that is not directly linked to the manner of your killing will result in you spending all the years that individual had left to live in behind. Each year you stay on the previous plane will mean a year of memories lost starting from your earliest. If you stay long enough to catch up to your age at death, the only memories retained will be those in the last moments of living. Please note, if you fall into this last state, then you will become whatever the strongest emotions fueling you are. You will remain for 100 cycles around the sun, or if by chance you complete your unfinished business, upon either of those outcomes, you will return here to be sorted once again. Please mark below. She opens the folder and turns to the last page. In tiny, cramped marks are names... Maybe. You can't really tell. They're a faded brown and too small to read. You frown. She hasn't offered her. It's it's not a pen like you first thought. Is it a bone? For you to write with? Blood please, hun. She jerks her head at the red pooling on the floor. You glance at the puddle. If you bend over, will more insides fall out? Would they give you a bag or something to put them in? You wrinkle your nose and slide a finger where your belly button used to be instead. It's warm and you can feel the prodding inside. Your stomach threatens to empty, but you aren't sure where it would go. So... You clench your teeth and pull your finger out again. It's not really a signature. Now you know why all the other names look like funny squiggles. Yours is a bit more blobby, a bit more drippy. Good, good. Afraid you won't remember this part when you wake up. Can't have the main question of the afterlife walking around the previous plane. You might give it away. She blows on your mark and her runny eye catches in the breeze. The iris does a little spin as it bumps against her nose. You can't stop staring. Something she said clicked, finally. Wake? 
There's relief spreading through you, warm and fuzzy. It is a dream after all, a horrible, I should probably tell my therapist kind of dream. Although you're a little worried what your therapist will pick up on from this one, maybe you'll keep it to yourself. Alrighty, all done. If you'd just like to head back the way you came. She motions past the queue. There's a kind of fog there, just hanging like a curtain. You realized you never looked behind before. No one seems to be looking behind. The doors are far more compelling. You step away from the desk, but there's an uncomfortable tug. Don't forget your inner time. This is the most intricate dream you've ever had, and it has to be one because you'd be screaming otherwise. Instead, there's a kind of... Acceptance. Maybe... Emptiness is a better word. Lowering yourself without bending is a bit challenging. Especially as one hand is trying to hold what's left inside and the other is scooping. You pretend really, really hard that it's sausages or jelly. You find you can pull on the cut skin and use it like a pouch for the floor bits. Once anything lumpy and attached is off the floor, you step tentatively away. No more tugging. You sigh in relief and start to walk towards the fog. It is not imposing, although maybe it should be. It is a little comforting, even. Familiar. You notice others coming out of it. They don't turn to look at you. Just keep plodding towards the desks. You wonder how many others did what you're doing now, and you just couldn't see them. You hesitate briefly at the edge of the fog. Will you be able to see in there? Will you know the direction to walk in? You realize now that you weren't given any instructions. You glance toward the desks, but the line is so long, and you don't think you can bring yourself to stand there again. Not now you can see the other people properly. No. You want to wake up. You step into the fog. You open your eyes, blink at the ceiling above you. It's familiar. With the old glow-in-the-dark stars you insisted to be put up when you were ten and very much into astronomy. Orion's belt, the only constellation you could reliably point out, and so the one that was stuck carefully to the ceiling with much fuss and redos. You go to close your eyes and then stop. Afraid the dream will come back. Although, you can't quite remember anything beyond fear. You take in a deep breath. Something metallic sticks in your throat. You're a bit cold. Must have kicked the blankets off in the night. Lolling your head to the side, you look at the bedside clock. But it's knocked over. You guess you were flailing about more than normal. But there's Mum's heavy footsteps in the hall downstairs, which means it's not yet six. She always brings in a cup of tea when she gets in from her shift. That's fine, then. Still time to get ready. You turn sleep-addled to the door and grin lovingly. Your Mum is the best, always there with a gentle smile and something warm. She calls your name. It sounds a bit... high-pitched. A bit... panicked. You frown. Maybe it was a really bad shift. Mom is running up the stairs now. You can hear her on the carpet, 
not muffled all that much because she's left her shoes on. She would give you an earful if you ever did that. She's calling again, over and over. There's a real fear there, and you are getting nervous. She pushes your door open. You open your mouth to say good morning, but instead, watch the color drain out of your mom's face. She crumples and keens. It's such a horrible sound. You sit up, confused. Mom, what? She stares for a second, and then screams. She's tripping backwards to get out of the room, making weird hiccuping, wailing noises in her throat. You want it to stop. Don't like seeing her like this. You get up. Your body feels strangely heavy, kind of like you're waiting. She's out of the door. You can hear her knocking into the bookshelf, the one you always stub your toe on when you shuffle to the bathroom in the early hours. It's taking you so long to get to the door. Why is it taking so long? Your room is hardly big enough for a bed, wardrobe, and rickety desk. You can jump to the door from the other side of the room if you try. Now, the floor seems to be sucking at your feet. Mom is shouting now. Her voice is shrill and you can't make out what she's saying. You've made it to the door. It's getting a bit easier. On the landing, the vase Mum made is in bits on the floor. Some books, too. Food. Maybe Mum brought it in. It's squashed into the carpet. There's a smear of something on the wall. It almost blends in with the brown pattern. It's dark and makes you... Uncomfortable, but you don't know why. You ignore it and follow Mum's trail. She's tipped things over all down the passage. The random souvenirs her sister sends from hopping around the globe. Photos on the wall, that god-awful taxidermy duck you've wanted to burn since she found it at a car boot sale. And more smears. They're similar to when a kid has caught a hold of some lipstick and gone rampaging. The front door is wide open. You can see the early morning light from the top of the stairs. You tromp down, not amused in the slightest. Mum has a few different tactics to get you out of bed. This is going a bit far. You get to the front door and stare. It's foggy outside too foggy to see anything. Where did the morning light go? There's a honk and a screech of brakes. Suddenly, Mum's not screaming anymore. There's a moment of horrifying silence. A car door opening. Voices gathering. It just ran out. She just... You feel cold again. This isn't real, is it? Another dream. Another nightmare. You take a juddering step forward, not caring about the pajamas and bare feet. You feel sluggish again. The door is so close. You don't want to step outside. But you're still moving forwards. There are sirens in the distance. Some horns blare, impatient. And shouting ensues. Someone is telling someone else to put pressure on it. You swallow thickly. The sirens are getting closer. There's crying. The messy, snotty kind, and it's the wrong sound for a child. The sirens are coming up the road. Louder and louder. Until they make your head vibrate. You can't see them, but you can imagine the lights from an ambulance shifting the features of people around. The blue is serious and drawn. The red stretches their mouths into sinister open maws. 
you grip the door frame. There's muffled conversation, a door slamming. A new wave of panic threatens to drown you. No, don't go. The sirens are starting again. They're pulling away. You push forwards and step over the threshold. You blink awake and frown at the stars on the ceiling. Are there some missing? Steps on the landing. Must be mom bringing tea. There's a frightened twinge. You had a bad dream, didn't you? Something involving mom. You sigh in relief and turn to the door expectantly. Then you frown. Your room seems oddly empty, although you can't figure out why. Maybe Mom tidied up for you yesterday. You've told her she doesn't have to. You'll get round to it when you can't find any more socks. But she does it anyway. Your room looks brighter, somehow. Whiter. It's amazing what running the hoover around can do. The steps have stopped outside your door, and they're shuffling about. You hear the dull thud of things knocking together. You smile and lift yourself from the bed. Sometimes when Mom gets back a little earlier, she'd make breakfast and bring it to you. Sounds like she can't hold the tray and get the door at the same time. You drag heavy feet to the door, reaching for the handle just as your fingers are about to brush it. The door opens. You stare. He stares. His eyes go wide and he drops his bucket and paintbrushes, and then he's screaming, and you scream too because it just slips out and seems appropriate in the situation. He throws the paint can at you, which is rather rude considering he's entering your bedroom without asking or even knocking. You're about to be offended at him, but he's running away. You scowl and poke your head out the door, thinking to shout at this intruder. Instead, you watch him turn look at you again, and stumble on the stairs. His foot catches on the railings. There's an audible, nauseating crack, and his leg goes one way, but his body continues. He screams again, this one higher, lanced with pain. Then his head bounces off the stairs, and he stops making any noises. Liquid begins to ooze down the steps. There's dust sheets down for some reason. It'll save the stairs from staining, at least. You go back to bed and sit. Lucid dreaming. That's a thing, isn't it? Maybe that's what you're doing. Maybe if you go to sleep in a dream, you wake up properly. You drop your head back onto the pillow. It seems rather hard, but you shut your eyes anyway. You blink awake. Things are slow to come to focus. There's grime in your eyes. Sometimes you cry in the night if you've been dreaming about something particularly sad. Although you can't remember the last one. It had been horrible, whatever it was. You wipe at your eyes and sniff loudly. The stars above are looking a bit old now. You wonder if they were any particular constellation or did you just stick them up any old how? Maybe it's time to get them down. You are probably too old for stars on the ceiling. But that means getting out the ladder, which is a death trap on the best of occasions. You lay in bed a while longer, shivering and not wanting to get out into even colder air. Eventually, though, you get up. You aren't hungry, but you should probably eat. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, Mum always says. Even though most of the time she's in such a rush, she doesn't take anything. 
It's freezing and yet you don't bother to put on a jumper. Instead, just zombie shuffling to the door. It's open, which is odd. Maybe Mum looked in on you before leaving. The landing is dark. You flail around for the light switch and smack it. Nothing happens. You frown. Power cut? You stumble along. There are candles downstairs for emergencies from that time Mum decided she was going to take up another hobby. It lasted a month, but now they had an endless supply of slightly wonky candles. You get to the stairs without stubbing your toe, which is an achievement in the dark, and start down the steps, careful to hang on to the banister. You hesitate before one step. Something about it makes you squirm inside. You stand on it anyway, unsure if you'd be able to catch yourself if you fell. You gasp as pain shoots through your leg and head. Then it's gone, as you continue shakily down the stairs. You rest your fingers against the wall and walk, slowly, trailing along. Your fingers make a slight rasping noise against the wallpaper. It sounds off-putting in the dark. You're about to rummage for matches in the understairs cupboard when you hear a hushed voice. You freeze, hands still on the wall. It's not, Mum. She's at work. The air seems to drop around you. The cold eating at your skin. You turn to head for the phone, but would it even work in a power out? You think about running outside to a neighbor. Maybe you should check first, though, just in case Mum has left the radio on again. You creep down the hall. There's light coming from the living room. It's flickering. You peer around the corner. Five people. You can't tell if they are teens or adults. Are sitting around a fire. They've set it in the middle of the room. You stare at them in horror. There are empty bottles and cans everywhere. Words and crude drawings have been sprayed on the walls. It's filthy. They are whispering and laughing and ignoring you completely. You should get help, but instead you are angry. How dare they? Sneaking into other people's houses and trashing it like this? You take one trembling step into the room, anger fueling you. Hey. They don't look up, even though you said it clearly. Hey. A couple of them have shifted a bit. You're shaking with fury now. Listen to me. You scream it, and they turn. Two of them scramble back. One is glancing about in confusion. The others are like deer in headlights. Get out of my house. A girl stands up too quickly. She knocks a bottle into the fire and flares. They are shouting, so are you. The fire is traveling, eating up cushions and furniture. The smoke is filling the room. They are yelling, trying to beat it out. You lunge for the door, planning to shout for help. Someone else is thinking the same, but still. When they see you, they back away. Towards the fire. You wrench the door open. Smoke billowing out. And step outside. You blink awake. There are some discolored plastic stars on the ceiling. You wonder what they're for. You lay there for a while, waiting. Waiting for what? You're not sure. After time has stretched out beyond comfort, you get up. You think the boiler may have packed up again because... You're freezing. You clamor from bed, ignoring the wet feeling. It's something you've got used to. When it's cold enough, things feel damp. And head for the door. You frown at the doorknob for a minute and then shake your head and grasp it. Turning and pulling the door open. You're still tired. Must be why everything is moving so slowly. 
You pause at the top of the stairs and look at one in particular. It's like the doorknob. Something is niggling at you, but you can't figure out what. You jump over it, unwilling to touch the wood. The house is so quiet. There's a key turning in the front door, and you smile as it opens. But the woman that walks in isn't familiar. Hello? Who are you? You begin to reach towards the umbrella stand. Was there always an umbrella stand? When the woman sighs quietly, Sandra, I'll get the place aired out and tidied. She picked up a weird basket filled with cleaning supplies. Your mother informed me of the circumstances, not to worry. You are confused because no one said anything to you. And you're still in your pajamas. Sandra closes the door and makes her way to the kitchen. You sidestep to avoid colliding. She certainly seems to be on a mission. You trail behind. It's not bad in here. Just a quick clean before your mother gets back from hospital. There's a brief flare of panic. Sirens and shouting. Then it fades. And you look around. It looks pretty tidy to you. Then again, your room usually looks like an explosion. Why hadn't Mother... Mum... Told you she'd hired a cleaner. Maybe she had, and it slipped your mind. That seemed to be happening more often. You decide to leave Sandra to scrubbing, and wander to the living room to listen to the radio. You may get a few steps in before your skin becomes too hot. You feel like you're choking. Pain, white and searing, is starting at your feet. You stumble from the room, heaving for air. You're pretty sure you screamed. Sandra should have heard you. Still panting, you go back to the kitchen. Sandra is tipping stuff from the fridge into the bin. The fridge is shinier than before. Taller, too. You shake your head. What are you doing? Why is she throwing away perfectly good food? Mum hates that. Sandra didn't respond, just sniffed at a can and pulled a face. Still, nothing. You can feel yourself getting angry. Anger is easier than being scared. I'm talking to you. There's a musical jingle, and Sandra taps at her ear. Hello? You frown. You've already said hello. Oh, I'm just at the Mason's place. Bit grim here. Old Biddy has been away for ages. This place is like an icebox. You scowl, realizing she isn't talking to you at all. I can be done by twelve. You grab a mug from the counter and hurl it to the ground. It shatters and Sandra screeches. Now you panic. You don't want to get in trouble. So you run for the door. It's foggy outside as you step through. Hey there. It's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing. And you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factors two-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done 
easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factor's no prep, no mess meals free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, they also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code scare you to sleep 50 at factormeals.com. As many scary to sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. You wake up, but keep your eyes closed. You want to go back to sleep. You're so tired. Hello? A voice downstairs. Your eyes snap open. A single star glows in off green above you. You glare at it. It's so out of place here. Hello? Oh, yes. You struggle from bed and stomp from your room. It's night. Someone is waving a torch around instead of turning on the lights. Is there anyone here who wishes to make contact? You trip over a step on the stairs when pain flares in your leg and a headache appears from nowhere. There are people wandering about. One of them has ridiculous goggles on their face. It gives them a strange green tinge, making them look a bit like a frog. Who are you? You're annoyed and indignant. The headache doesn't help. Come on, I've set it up. The strangers gather at the end of the hall in the living room, and you follow. They aren't listening. You are about to walk into the room, but stop as your skin prickles. Instead, you stand on the edge and watch. Four people sit around a board, letters and numbers on the outer part of the board, hello and goodbye. 
are written in curling letters. Yes and no, in bolder, darker ones. And a funny wedge with a hole sits in the middle. You frown as each of the people places a finger on the wedge. A strange sensation tickles you. It's far more pleasant than stepping into the living room, but no less unnerving. Is there anyone here who wishes to make contact? The same question from earlier. This time, in hushed, ominous tones. Someone giggles, <laughs> another shushes them. The tickle turns into a zap, and you jump in surprise. Are there any spirits here? Another zap. Should be spoiled for choice. The comment is muttered and the person shoved, but they keep their finger on the wedge. You watch as it moves haltingly to the yes. Someone shrieks quietly. <laughs> you wonder what the goal of this game is. Do they all have to work together or does one person control the wedge? Surely they could tell if just one person was controlling it. What is your name, spirit? This time it isn't a zap. It's sharp and hot. Your fingers and toes buzz uncomfortably. Try an easier one. One grumbles and looks around, goggles up on their forehead now. Like what? Are you dead? It hurts. Whatever they're doing, it's hurting you. Lancing up your arms and legs, fizzling in your spine. You want to stop them, but it burns to step forwards. What happened to you? Well, how is that easier? I can't even answer that on the board. The voices blur. The pain is solid. In your veins, in your bones. You step into the room. There's a vice around your lungs, squeezing your throat. Your eyes sting. Maybe they're shy. Shy? What do you think? They aren't speaking back because we're a bit too much for them? You can't see properly. Your vision is fuzzy, hazy. You stumble on, wanting them to stop. We promise we won't bite. Hello? The pain rips from your throat, scouring the inside and coming out as a screech. You take the wedge feeling its resistance for a moment before launching it across the room. The relief is immediate. You're still burning, but that's not so consuming. The anger is, though. Get out! Get, get out, out! Get out! Get out! Get out! You lunge for them, sinking fingers into them. It's strange and clammy. The person shudders and wobbles on their feet. You shake them fingers lost somewhere around their throat. The others are shouting, screaming. They try to pull at the one you have. Your hands have sunk further. They're gasping in front of you, breath catching, their faces going red, and their eyes have rolled up so only the whites show. You pull your hands back violently. It's too much. You don't want this. They drop to the floor, and you turn, running back upstairs. It is safe up there, in your room, away from everything. You slam the door and dive under the covers, pulling them tight over your head and clenching your eyes shut, praying you wake up. You open your eyes, slowly. It's hard. So hard. They want to drag shut again, but something keeps them from doing that. Something that makes your insides clench and your heart feel like it's being pulled backwards. So you leave them open and look at the clean white of the ceiling. No, not completely clean 
There are marks where something was stuck for a long time, slightly whiter than the surroundings. The door creaks open, a ponderous, sluggish movement. You tip your head to the side in a similar manner. There's a cat. It cocks its head in the slightly off-putting way cats do when they are looking at something that isn't actually there. You turn and glance behind you. Nothing there. The cat lets out a small. It almost sounds like a question. You look back at it. It's definitely staring at you. You reach out and beckon it closer. It gives a haughty flick of its tail, then walks back out. You climb out of the bed and follow after it. Its fur looks soft. You want to stroke it. Annoyance skitters through you. Why did it leave? The landing is light, sleek, shiny even, but garishly colored toys litter the ground. A tripping hazard if you ever saw one. There's a large mirror and you purposefully avoid your reflection. Even the thought of it makes you squirm. The cat, orange and plump, is pattering down the stairs. You continue to cry out as pain stabs into your leg. Now your head is throbbing. Little spikes travel across your skull. The cat twitches its ear at your shout, but nothing else. You glance down, trying to find what you fell over. If it was one of those blasted toys, you might throw it down the stairs or at the mirror. There's no toy. You frown, unease and anger bubbling under your skin. A strange and airy squeal emerges from somewhere downstairs. The cat is heading that way. So you follow again, the pain fading, only slightly. The sleekness continues on this floor. You are careful not to linger too long in one spot, because the floor has such a shine. You might see yourself in it. The room is filled with more toys and you step into it, trying to find the cat. Something grasps at your heart. Tight, I see. You're gasping. It hurts, it hurts. That noise comes again. It's so alien to the sensation you are feeling, so unfair. You push on and the pain dwindles with the other. Anger is forcing your feet after that sound. It is hotter than the discomfort, more lively than you felt in so long. You think the room is wider than it should be, more open. You can see the dining table, chairs, the kitchen. Should you be able to see those? And it's all so polished, so sterile looking. The gurgling, burbling sound comes from a child. It sits, meaty little fists banging up and down on a mat that lights up. You stare at it. It stretches its mouth upwards and the noise comes out. You move closer. Now you are burning, lungs constricting, eyes stinging. You wail long and low before stumbling back. Again. The pain dissipates, but fingers of it latch onto your skin, as if you're being lightly singed. You're almost surprised you can't smell burning hair. The child is watching you now, eyes wide and large. It waves a block at you and stretches its mouth again. You wonder what it's doing, you try to copy it but your mouth won't move. You push your fingers into your cheeks and pull. It's a bit disturbing, the sound it makes, the distance your fingers go. 
so you stop. Someone else comes into the room. They are making the same face, eyes bright and dancing. It makes you uncomfortable. You wait for them to look at you. They don't. They bend down to the child, pick up some toys, wipe at the child's dribbling mouth. Not once do they glance over. It hurts again. A different kind of hurt, something deeper and far more alarming. You don't understand. So you let the anger come up. It's helping, surging and sweeping away the fear that is gnawing at your bones. In the anger, you don't feel the burning as much, nor the ice in your heart or the stabbing in your head. You can move forwards and shove at the one that's ignoring you. They stagger and stare around wildly. Still, they don't see. You push again harder. An odd sensation. Sticky, clammy, cold. They plunge back over some furniture and their shout is cut off by a ferocious crack. The child is crying now and it rattles up your spine. Your fingers bite into your palms again, much deeper than you want, and you turn. Quiet! It only cries louder, reaching for the one on the floor. You move towards it, intent on making it stop. It is such a horrendous howl, and it's making your insides squirm. But the cat hisses and swipes at you. You shiver. It does not scratch, but leaves the impression of one except it burrows deep, lacerating at your legs. The cat arches its back, hair standing up. You snarl at it and lunge. It's faster than you, darting away with a yowl. It skids on the shining floor and your nails scrape its tail. It is through the little door before you can grasp it. And without stopping, you follow. You wake up. Where are you? You open your eyes, it's dark, nearly dark. There's light pooling under the door, soft and warm. A thump on the wall. You watch it to see what happens. Some cursing on the other side, but that's it. There's a sudden spike of fear and you glance around but find no cause. Music, intrusive and loud, blares beyond the door and is aborted just as quickly. Your head lolls to one side and you watch the light. Do you have the want to pull yourself out there and see what is happening? Footsteps move from the space beyond your wall, past your door and further away. They fade until you can't hear them anymore. There are no other sounds. Your eyes rove the room. The dim light doesn't illuminate much. Cobwebs, mostly. Some broken furniture. A blank, cracked ceiling. Your eyes linger on that spot above you for a moment. When nothing changes, you look back to the light. It is strangely comforting. Time doesn't really happen here, or you have no concept, at least. It could have been years you stared into the glow, or a few breaths. But the footsteps are returning, and they aren't alone. The light flickers. A voice slightly higher than the cursing one is speaking. I love what you've done with the place. Very romantic. Do you buy your candles pre-dripped? A low reply. They are passing your room. Entering the space past the wall. Oh. You blink at the exclamation, wondering what they are seeing. I've got a classic for us to watch. And the good cheese. The good cheese. I must say, you've outdone yourself, Mr. Harris. Anything for the lady. 
Harris and Lady. That is what they call each other. Your imagination cannot conjure any images of what they look like. It's completely blank. You sure it's all right for us to be here? My parents would never speak to me again if I ended up being taken home in the back of a police car. Don't worry about it. No one comes here. Can't even sell the place. That sign has been out there for years. Music starts playing. Not as invasive as before. And other noises. But it doesn't seem to be coming from the people now. The muffled quality lulls you. And you stare at the light again. No, Harris, not yet. You blink. Look at the wall. But it's been weeks. And I said, not yet. A pause. Come on, this is really nice. Don't spoil it. You're the one spoiling it. A shuffling sound. Harris, I said no. More scuffling. The wall is being banged into. Stop it. Something breaking and a grunt. Fear is pounding through you now. A door slams and footsteps are hurrying past. Bitch! It's a bellow, enraged and moving. The second set of feet go past, heavy and thundering. Something is holding you still. It is horribly familiar. A shriek and more noises as things break or are tumbled into. Harris, please! Another cry and shout, one from each, you think. There are footsteps all over the place now. The wall shakes with impacts, and your door is thrown open. A person darts in, eyes wide and searching. They turn to put their weight against the door, but someone else barges in. There's blood in their hair and fury on their face. Please, Harris, don't. Ah, so the one backing away is Lady, and Harris is stalking forwards, like a cat would, towards some small and soft thing. The fear is icy, hard, and lodges in your throat. They haven't noticed you. Lady scoops something from the floor, a brick, maybe? Harris lunges forward and Lady smacks their hand with the brick. Harris yells, and Lady stumbles at the backhand to the face. Harris knocks Lady the rest of the way and lands on top. They still haven't noticed you. There is something else alongside the fear, something that is starting to burn. Fucking weeks. All you had to do was lay there. The words hit you. Almost physically. They are both struggling, wriggling on the floor like fish. Lady is scratching, biting, kicking anything to get away. But Harris is bigger and pins Lady's body. The burning is spreading. It's like anger, but anger is too small a feeling. Harris sinks a fist into Lady's stomach. Lady is gasping and sobbing. Oh, for fuck's sake, stop crying, would you? If you'd just gone along with it, this wouldn't be happening. You sit up and watch Harris. Lady is blurring in your vision. But Harris is getting clearer. You can see the little veins that have popped in their eyes. The sweat on their neck. The blood on their knuckles. It's quite easy to stand. You're vaguely surprised. It's even easier to make your way over to where the two are tangled on the floor. Harris is pawing at Lady's clothes. Lady is screaming and scrabbling and then sees you. Hesitating. For a second. Harris lets out a triumphant noise until you fist your hand in their hair and wrench. You are furious. Harris flies into the door, swearing and coughing. Wrath is the feeling. You are pleased you have worked it out. Harris looks up and stops. His gaze one of horror. You walk forwards, 
slowly, relishing each step. Harris isn't moving, is just watching you, face paling. When you reach them, you lean down and stare into their bloodshot eyes. Then you plunge your hand into their stomach and squeeze. The howl of pain is extraordinary. It would rattle your teeth if you could feel them. You poke a thumb into one of those bloodshot eyes, ignoring the thrashing and odd cold feeling until it gives, popping like a jelly balloon. There's a rush of air as Lady scrambles past you, but you let them go. It's not Lady that is making you burn after all. Harris bubbles, blood dribbling into the white teeth and making them cough. You move your hand upwards, dragging as you go, savoring the whimpers. You swap to the other eye and push until it pops like the first. You can't actually feel the hot mess on your hand. You can imagine it, though. Finally, your hand is holding Harris's heart. Quick and frightened as it is, you lean in until your mouth is near their ear. This is my house. And you squeeze again. You blink awake, frowning, unsure what woke you. Maybe mum was home from her night shift? You glance at the clock on your bedside table. It flashes a red 2.34 a.m. Mum's shift doesn't finish for another three hours yet. You grumble and turn over, thinking it must have been Nugget, bringing home a poor defenseless mouse. Another thump, this one a little louder, a little nearer. Your eyes spring open and you can feel your heart rate pick up. Unless Nugget has decided to haul in a deer or something, you don't think it's the cat anymore. A tinkle of glass smashing downstairs. You screw your eyes shut and try to think. Blood rushes in your ears. There's the new phone on the bookshelf. The one Mum signed up for six months ago because you kept walking away with the one in the kitchen and she would trip over the cord. It was only installed a few days before. You grip your sheets in relief. It's not far off. The cord will reach into your room easily. A few steps outside your bedroom is all. Your nice, safe bedroom. You shake your head. There's no saying it'll be safe for much longer. And you can ring for help before hiding. You forego the slippers. You've tripped over them too often and head for your door. The handle is cool under your hand, and you try to quell the shaking. You turn it, slowly, hoping it doesn't squeak. There aren't any lights on, and you can see a sliver of downstairs through the banisters. A torch beam swings slowly about. You swallow thickly and step out, opening the door as little as possible. The bookshelf is just over. You crunch your big toe into it and bite your tongue to stop the shout. You've told Mum a million times, either get a nightlight or move the stupid shelves. You glance over. The light hasn't moved. And you breathe again. You run your hands along the shelves until you find the phone. You slide it out and bring the receiver to your ear, finger fumbling over the nine. No sound. You scrabble a bit more in the dark and find the end is not actually connected to anything. You try not to cry. Why isn't it connected? Another look over the banister. You crouch down, half crawl, half waddle, one hand skimming the wall at the level you think the new connector is. You're pretty sure your heart is just going to explode from your chest. There's sweat on your lip and prickling between your shoulder blades. Your fingers brush over the panel and you fumble with the phone cable, trying to get it the right way up. 
A sudden thundering of footsteps. Stop. Light invades your eyes as a woman turns her torch on you from the bottom of the stairs. You stare at her, eyes wide. You can't really make out much. The torch gives enough to tell that she's not much older than you, wearing dark clothes. What the fuck are you doing? You're indignant. She's asking you that? This is my house. Your voice is a bit shaky, but it's clear. Get out! She wobbles slightly and flings a hand out to search for a light switch. It comes on, slowly, the hum of the light bulb far too loud in the silence. She is coming up the stairs slowly, her feet silent on the carpet. You think of running, each step closer she takes, but you're frozen. Your muscles quivering. Don't you know me? Her voice is raspy, like she'd been crying. You squint at her, maybe she'll go away if you talk to her. A bit shorter than you, dark hair, bloodshot eyes looking a little manic. She has a tin in her other hand. You shake your head. She takes a juddering breath. (gasps) Fucking weeks! She hisses and swings the torch around. You jerk back. Fucking weeks! I've been watching you and you can't even glance my way! You stare, confused. Could she have the wrong person? You've honestly never seen this woman in your life. You didn't think you were that unobservant. She glares at you and waves the torch some more. It's a clunky thing, and it will hurt if it hits you. That you started talking with Joe, of all people. I mean, seriously? Your stomach plummets. You had been getting friendly with Joe. Maybe a bit more than friendly. Still, this woman's face isn't coming to mind. She looks angry now. You release the phone. It's no use to you and hold your hands out placatingly. I'm sorry, why... Why didn't you come talk to me? You're really hoping she didn't, that you haven't forgotten, and it makes her angrier. She slumps a bit. You always look so happy, and I... She fiddles with the torch, tugs at the raincoat she's wearing. I couldn't do it with other people around. She suddenly grins. Which is why I came tonight. Come on, I made you your favorite. Apple cake. She is watching you expectantly, and cold is inching up your spine. That is your favorite. You're taller than her. You could win if she tried to go for you. She abruptly drops the torch. It makes a solid thunk as it hits the floor. Then, she is brandishing the tin. You back up another step, pasting a smile on your face. We can have it in your bedroom. She's glancing at you, then to the open door to your room. There's no way out in there, though, and there isn't even a decent lock on the bathroom. Your best bet is trying to make a break for the door. My... My room is a mess. I wouldn't want to put you through that. How about we go to the kitchen? We can get plates and everything. She scrunches her nose. It's okay. I brought napkins. We can have it like a picnic. And she sits down. You watch as she opens the tin. The cake does look good, but you have no appetite whatsoever. You doubt you could even force it down with how dry your mouth is. She's absorbed in the cake, in setting out red napkins, folding them into shapes. You walk over, slowly, your breath seizing in your lungs, vision narrowing to that gap next to her. You make a dash for the stairs behind her. She cries out and reaches for you. You grab a book and hurl it at her. You're about to go past, heart pounding in your ears so all you can hear is a rushing noise, and she throws her whole body at your legs. You both go down, so close to the top of the stairs. She's swearing and crying. You flail about, grabbing the closest thing to you. 
The taxidermy duck isn't much of a defense. But she lets go and you scrabble back. You should have stayed in your room. Why didn't you stay? There's a glint of something in her hand. Bile coats your throat, and you really need to pee. The knife is long. A bit much for a cake. She thumps the wall, making a couple picture frames fall and crack on the floor. Some trinkets from Aunt Mana topple off their little perches. I can't believe you. I made you your fucking favorite food and this is how you act? She scoops the tin from the floor and you cover your face as it sails, cake toppling towards you. She's right behind it, knife leading. The first slice doesn't register, other than the cold air that chills your stomach. You grab Mum's vase, apologizing, and crash it over her. Her arm takes the brunt of it, and she shrieks. You grab another book, try to block the blade. It's got red on it. You swipe a hand over your stomach, stumble as she swings wide and catch yourself on the wall. She stamps hard on your foot and you yell. You trip, smacking your head on the banister. You grab at the railings, vision swimming, sweat adding to the blurriness. A hand on your shoulder turns you gently. She's right up in your face. Her eyes are wide brown and she's crying again. Why couldn't you just talk to me? What does Joe have that I don't? Anger twists her features and the knife comes down. Your head is still buzzing. You can't feel anything. Did she miss? It comes down again and again. You hear something meaty happening. But it's a long way off. Then there's a fierce tug in your gut. And she climbs off of you. The landing light halos as she stands. She's watching you, head on one side. There's splatters of something wet on her. She sighs and shakes her head. All you had to do was talk to me. Now look. She dips to pick up her tin and shovels the cake bits back into it best she can. You don't deserve this. And she leaves. Just like that. You listen, straining your ears. All you can hear is your heart. It's so quick. You pull yourself up, using the wall to stop falling back down. You feel a bit wet. Have you peed yourself? You wouldn't be surprised. It hurts to breathe. She might have crushed her rib. You wobble towards your room. You lean hard into the wall. Your legs are shaking. Hands too. Even your eyes feel like they're shaking. Something is sliding, slipping around by your belly button. Your teeth are chattering. You feel cold. That'll be the adrenaline wearing off. You should probably go for the phone now. But you need to sit down for a minute. Your foot's on fire. Your head is spinning and there's something wrong around your middle. It's quiet now. Enough that it makes your ears ring. You're really wet. It's traveling down your pajamas. Warm and kind of sticky. You sit on the bed, sinking down and wincing. The pain is coming to the front now. You struggle for the bedside lamp. Your fingers feel fat and stiff. You knock the clock over. When you finally click the lamp on and light fills the room, you're confused. There's an awful lot of red and what is that glistening and pulsating? It's making a very unpleasant noise. A sort of 
slithering squelch. Your breathing is shallow, sharp. Cold is spreading from your middle, and yet there's sweat on your forehead, prickling on your neck. Shock. That's what this is. You just need to calm down. The bed is soft, and you can look up at the stars above you. You carefully ignore the slimy warmth. Place your hands gently over your stomach. The nausea is back. It spikes as you tuck in something that has fallen out. Pull the shredded skin back to keep it all together. Your stars aren't so bright with the light on. Your eyes are heavy. Just a short nap. Then you can call for help. Call mom and let her know what happened. You haven't even checked to see how she got in. You blink, slowly, until opening your eyes is too much. It's all right, just for a minute. You step out of fog into brightness and squint at the long lines of people ahead of you. This is a strange dream, kind of familiar. You shuffle into place behind someone with a hole in their chest. If you crouch a bit, you can see right through the back of an old woman. It's stringing and dripping, so you don't look too long. For the number of people, there's not much noise. No one is talking to each other or muttering about the wait. They all look a bit blank and just shuffle along. There are those at the front of the lines who are speaking, but only to the ones sitting behind the desks. It's too far for you to make out yet. You look about some more. There are a couple of people that catch your eye. They stare at you in return. None of you make a move from your respective lines. No one else has caught your eye. These two seem to have a bit more freedom. Like you. They're horrendous to look at, though. There's a solidity to the people around you. However gruesome, the others. They make you uncomfortable. And now that you've been watching, you can see there's a wider space around them. Like the people lining up have subconsciously decided they shouldn't get too close. You glance around at your line. There's a space around you, too. A scream knifes through the room, and you whip to watch as shadows leak from the door and wrap around someone. No one flinches at the noise. A few curious people glance over, but nothing else. You shudder. Vague recollections are bubbling near the surface. Does deja vu exist for dreams? You shuffle along. Time stretches, but you don't feel bored or tired. In fact, you don't feel all that much. Which you think is surprising given the number of walking corpses around you. That's what they have to be. Too many of them wouldn't survive with the injuries they have. They certainly wouldn't be forming orderly cues. Oh, hi, hi. Nice to see you again. You come back and see that holy man had wandered away towards the doors. You didn't even hear his conversation. The woman behind the desk is smiling and has a name tag with Maggie. But it's difficult to focus on that. You swallow at the dangling eye blinking at you. The nerve connecting the eye has dried and shriveled. It looks like bad jerky. Her skull is very white. The bits showing between patches of matted hair and something that looks like overcooked chicken. You get a good look at the top of her head when she leans over. You have to glance away. Maggie reaches under her desk and pulls out an old book, flipping through until she reaches her page. Standard haunting and you signed. Ah, here you are. She taps at a squiggle. She slides another piece of paper, newer, cleaner than the book, 
and runs her finger down it. So, that's one death by car? Sirens, shouting, despair, grief. One by head trauma? A yell of pain, silence of a fall. Three burned to death. The other two did go earlier than they would have if you hadn't interfered. Overdose and damaged lungs. That's a bit of a gray area, so they don't count. Lucky you. She winked. The smell of smoke. The fear. The anger. Ah, I see you got more involved here. Strangled one yourself. That cold, clammy feeling. The whites of the eyes. You're shaking. Oh dear. Broke this one's neck. High pitched screaming, the thud of a body hitting the floor, the desperation to stop the pain. And last but not least, and I thought this was rather nice myself, technically heart failure, but his body was rather taxed from the torture. Fury, hot and hard and everywhere. You shut your eyes as they come back. All of them. And you. You look down. You're grayish in color. Your guts are on display, dried and husk-like. The flap of skin you use to keep them in is waving, uselessly. You would cry, if you could. So that is eight deaths caused by you with a combined year total of... She shuffles some more papers around, takes out an abacus and mutters to herself. You stand in your newfound dread and try to hold on to the thought that this is still a dream. It isn't working. 388. She smiles again and motions to the doors. Now, if you would proceed to the door on the right. You take a step back. The door on the right ate someone before. The one that was screaming. No! No! I... I didn't mean to kill anyone. Your voice is rasping. Maggie taps the book again. Sorry, hun. As per the terms and conditions, any death due to your presence or actions is reflected on your time, 388 years in behind. Don't fuss now. I've known people go in for much longer than you. You wait. She doesn't elaborate. Were they okay once they got out? Oh, I never saw them again. (laughs) Go on. You don't want the sentry to come get you. You back up a step, glancing at the door. Everything in you screams to run, to get away, to go back through the fog. But what will you be then? You can remember the anger that ate at you until there was nothing else. Until you forgot every face, every smile, everything. You close your eyes. Wait for a moment. Open them. The walk is short. And the door opens. Silently. Shadows lick the edge. You stare. Black. Endless and suffocating. You step through. Thanks for listening. Thank you again to Rhiannon Pugsley, the author this week. And remember to go check out my episode of Hometown Ghost Stories, or my most recent episode. And I also did another one a couple months ago. So check out Hometown Ghost Stories again. If you want to see my face, you can go to YouTube. If you want to just listen to my voice and their voices as well, then find them on anywhere you get your podcasts. They're also part part of Bloody FM. They're, They're buds from my network. So please go check them out. If you want to follow the show on social media, you can follow it at Scare You to Sleep on all the socials. Um, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, 
um, Facebook. Uh, I think that's all of them. Oh, there's a there's a subreddit as well that I don't really check in on. I feel like it's I, I created the subreddit a long time ago, thinking like I needed to do it all, but now I'm like, oh, I I know like I don't know. I feel like subreddits aren't actually for for the people to be in of who are <laughs> being discussed. I don't know. It's weird. I'm weird. Anyway, um, if you'd like a story considered for the show, please send it to scare you to sleep at gmail.com. That's also where you can reach me with any questions or comments or complaints, whatever is on your mind. And here comes the part of the show where I ramble a little bit so we can ease ourselves to sleep and convince ourselves that there are no ghosts watching us from over our shoulders. So... <laughs> This week, I did some baking, finally, finally. Uh, If you follow me, oh, you can also follow me personally, by the way, on social media, at Shelby B. Scott, and uh, I posted on my personal Instagram this cake I made. It's an apple cake, and it looked beautiful, and the idea was great, but I don't think my execution was great, so if you are in the Scary scary to Eat uh, Facebook group, and I posted the recipe, it it was probably user error, but the recipe, the the base part, the bread part, just did not turn out great. I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. And again, it was probably user error. I don't want to blame the recipe, but I personally, it wasn't the best. The apple part and the streusel part, very, very good. I want to try a different type of apple streusel cake again. So if you have any apple streusel recipes, please send them my way. I won't keep you too long this week since this week's episode was so long already and I am going to go make some tea, read this new horror book I got. I haven't started it yet so I'm not going to name, tell you what it, what it's called just yet but once I start going, if I really like it, I will definitely come back and give you guys a, a good rec for it and let you know where to get it and everything. So I'm going to keep that one a little secret for right now but I'm very excited about it, the premise of it is is incredibly interesting to me it's an anthology as well so i'll keep you posted on on that (laughs) all right i hope you're all having an excellent weekend an excellent night and i hope you're finding great ways to stave off the winter blues and i will see you next week go get some sleep sweet dreams (laughs) 